Welcome to Living Word, growing a family that experiences every promise of God. You're listening to another life-changing word from Dr. Tom Anderson. For more information, visit our website at livingwordonline.com. Amen. Happy Father's Day. Bless God. Good to see all of your smiling faces out there. And uh, I know there's a lot of fathers that are probably doing things, but I'm thankful for fathers that place God first on Father's Day because he's our father. Amen. Come on, somebody. And uh, we're all here because of him to start with. Amen. And I want to talk about some of that today as we continue on with, we're talking about the blood, talking about the cross, and we're tying it into the Abrahamic covenant. And it started with a thought uh, a few months ago about do we really understand the Abrahamic covenant? Do we actually understand all that was accomplished by the blood and by the cross? And what is the Abrahamic covenant? And how extensive is it? And what should it mean to us? And when did it start? And when do, when do we become part of it? When do we become sons of Abraham? And all of the things that we read in the Word. And that's what I've been trying to study and, and to research and to be able to bring to you. And uh, I think the more we understand it, the more we'll believe it, the more we'll trust in it and apply our faith to begin to live by the promises of God instead of almost by the promises of God or living by a part of the promises of God but not all of the promises of God. Remember he was taking one group into a promised land but now in a born again situation we are now entering into a spiritual promise, the promises of health and wealth and joy and peace and highly favored that these are the promises of God. It's not a location, it is something that God has placed in us with the ability to believe for something that he has already done. That he finished it on his seventh day and now we've entered the seventh day and that means that everything that we would ever need ever need to experience in our flesh, ever need to experience in our lives, ever need to experience in our children, our spouse, our life, our job, every area was already finished that seventh day. Amen. And he's moved us to a place of seventh day. Now I'm going to try and this came to me this morning. I don't know how full, how complete uh, the thought is yet, but You've heard me teach a few weeks ago about the word be it, or the first letter in the ancient Hebrew and the first, or the second letter in the ancient Hebrew, but the first letter in the Bible, and that it means the house of God, holy dwelling place of the Lord. So from the foundation, we see that God's plan was basically the church, a place to prepare his bride. And then we see things that happen along the way. We see the calling of Abraham, who certainly wasn't anything special except God found a heart. Hello, somebody. He found a heart that might actually believe God. And he moved him out of a pagan area and said he wanted to take him to a land of promise. And of course, the land of promise he was taking them to was something that was going to happen in his heart more than it was the land they were going to live in. And somehow I think that Christians today need to separate the two from the promised land to this promised area that God has for us right now in the church age ready for us to receive by faith. That's the location right now is here. Hello? And it's been provided through the anointed one, the Jesus, the Christ, which means the anointed one, who paid a price with his blood on the cross. So that's what we've been talking about that. And then we see that things happened uh, from Genesis chapter 12, but we also see that there was a time where God got a hold of Abraham and there was the cutting of animals and and so on, splitting in half of them. There was a process of passing through, but Abraham went to sleep in church, and so God did the covenant. <laughs> you see, because the old covenant was 
what God did and what we did, but we never can live up to that covenant. So God had to do the covenant for us. Hello? Because he never fails. He is faithful. If he said it, it's true. It's something you can count on, even though he can't always count on us. Hello? And so that was part of the covenant. Then there was a, a, a process that went on that God came. I think I'll read that to you. Um, if you have your Bibles, turn them to Galatians chapter 3. And it says, uh, unto those who are of the faith of the sons of Abraham, we've seen the sons of Abraham when he talked about, in Luke chapter 19, he talked about Zacchaeus. He said, he has become a son of Abraham. No, that would mean that it was, he was speaking about the ultimate salvation that was available after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. To be a son of Abraham, it was going to require the other side of the cross. Y'all okay? And he said, and these scriptures foresee or foretold that God would justify the Gentiles. So this is telling us that God wanted not he wanted a salvation to be available to the whole world. He wanted the blessing to be available to the whole world. But ultimately, he wanted the blessing to be available to his bride. So he wanted to justify all races, all color, all cultures, all everybody, including the Jew, that would receive Christ, of whosoever will, could be the part of the bride of Christ. So justification. He had to set up a program that would include the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And then it, that, the, that he preached the gospel. This is really important for you to grasp this. He preached the gospel to Abraham thousands of years before the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. He showed him the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and Abraham chose to believe God, and it was counted as righteousness to him, similar to our salvation as we are righteous only because of the cross and the blood. So Abraham, are you... That's why Hebrews talks about there are those that saw it from afar off. In fact, the scripture says David did as well. He saw the death, burial, and resurrection. That's the reason he could write in Psalms, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life because he had already experienced the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Is anybody home? You go, wow. I, and I know that I'm going to get a little deeper on this today, and it, I, but I, I want you to grasp that in Colossians chapter 1 and verses uh, 19 and 20, it says it, it, Jesus' responsibility, and God was so happy because Jesus reconciled those things that were in heaven and those that's invisible, and those things that are on, on the earth. He reconciled them all to himself, and God was very pleased with that process of reconciliation so that Everything that had been lost, and that's what we did at our 50th, we were trying to help the congregation and people to receive back everything that has ever been lost because Jesus reconciled, he, he was reconciling enmity between races, enmity between Jews and Gentile. He was, he was trying to set up a, a program where everyone could love everyone. and especially those that become the part of the bride of Christ or the sons of Abraham that we might operate in something called love. Wouldn't that be really cool? And we see in his church such breakdown of that that I, I find it difficult to call them church. 
church is the preparation of the bride of Christ. It is, well, I'm going to take you to it here in just a few moments, um, but we need to understand that through the blood and through the cross, he reconciled, paid the price for our past, present, and future, but he also paid for all of the things that had been lost and stolen by the enemy, so they once he resurrected firstborn of the grave, he, you and I could get back anything that the devil has stolen from us in our lifetime. Hallelujah. All he's saying is you have to believe it. See, God has it. The devil doesn't have it. He is resourceless, empty. He's in darkness and has no resource unless we give it to him. Unless we believe his lies, he has no power. That's the reason he can stay under your feet if your words, if your actions, if your life doesn't empower him. Mm. Is that all right? Now, in the research of all of this, trying to find the best explanation and the truth so that you might understand and grasp the truth of what the Abrahamic covenant truly is. So I went back and I started studying just everything that I could find on the word covenant. Kind of interesting, the word covenant simply means um, to choose the best or to select the best. That's what a covenant is. To select the best, which is what we probably all attempt to do uh, with what we have and who we are. Guy wasn't happy about his the wife he married, but it was the best he could get with the equipment he had. And his wife said, "You know, I got better grades than you did. I was valedictorian in my college." I ended up with a better job. I make more money than you. I stay healthier than you. But the husband said, yeah, but I'm married better. <laughs> Selecting the best. Anyway, so, so when we look at this uh, process and understand how uh, the covenant works, when you research the words Abrahamic covenant in the ancient Hebrew, it comes out and for particular words. So as I was going through the process, we, we see all the way up to the cross from be it in the beginning the house and then the cross of Calvary and Jesus dies and goes to hell, takes back everything that's been lost and resurrects as the firstborn of the grave. But on the cross he said something very interesting and uh, Gary mentioned this last week when we were talking. And when Jesus said, it is finished, we have to ask ourselves, what was finished? What was actually finished? What was finished was the selection of the best, the sinless Christ that paid the price, and the Abrahamic covenant was set in motion and birthed on the cross by the blood. The covenant that we now live under was birthed at that particular moment. So the Abrahamic covenant is what we live under, but what does it actually mean to us? What should it mean to us? Maureen was teaching not too long ago, and that's kind of set me off on this, about uh, rejuvenation and, and some things. If God wants to live 120 years, um, there's not too many people, that, especially generals and people that we would consider great leaders in the Word of God and great faith ministers and all of that sort of thing, uh, dying in their 70s and 80s, and, and, uh, and the great people, uh, we understand that, I'm not, not judging them in any sense of the word, but what about the 120 years? What is it that we're missing in this covenant that paid for every single thing and provided healing wholeness, has provided wealth and joy and peace, all, every good thing that we would need to live a long life on this? What, what, what are we missing? 
What part of this covenant are we not understanding or grasping so we could grab a hold of it by faith and actually fulfill the 120 years? The first thing that came to me was we need faith and action. In other words, we need to be conscious of what we say, not empowering the enemy or believing his lies. We need to be careful what we put in our mouth, not only what comes out of our mouth. Uh, when I preached on that back in 2000, I lost 400 people because you don't mess with people's food. Okay, so we won't go down that road any further, but, and I thought Jesse's message that was here last month was, was uh, so timely, and he added another element. I don't know if you all caught the other element. It's faith, action, and time. In the beginning, God set us on a platform of time. He's not according but time, but we are according to time. And it's those that stick to it and not give up and not stop, but continue until the healing happens, until the wealth comes, until. Hello? We have to persevere sometimes through situations. I mean, I was ready to build, but it took four years to get me ready and us all ready before we could. So it took time, not just faith, not just action, had all the plans done, but it took time. So we need to adjust ourselves to something called patience. That's deep. Very deep. So I'm giving you kind of the basic run right now of the Abrahamic Covenant. So it is, it starts out with the letter that we've been very familiar with, second letter of the ancient Hebrew, be it. This is how the Abrahamic Covenant is spelled in the ancient Hebrew with giving us meaning of what the Abrahamic Covenant is. You all follow me? So the first one is be it, which is the second letter in the ancient Hebrew, and you know it's at the house of the Lord. So we know that the Abraham covenant is directly connected to the church. It was where the church was birthed when Jesus said it is finished, and what birthed the Abrahamic covenant was the birth of the church. It was the entrance into the seventh day. It was the entrance into the position and the place where grace could operate because the price had finally been paid in full. Well, maybe you're getting this. The second letter in its spelling is Rish. Now, Rish is the 20th letter in the ancient Hebrew, and Rish means uh, uh, obvious. The church is where we are to get enlightenment and illumination into a personal relationship with Father God. Hello? It's where we come to hear the word and grow in faith. It's, it's here where we begin to get revelation of what God said and how to apply it to our lives on a regular basis. How, how exciting is that? To me, it's exciting to me. I know that New Age has stole the word enlightenment, but we're not going to let them keep it. It belongs to the Bible. It's a... Okay? It's gaining revelation and understanding. We serve Christ Jesus, the church, the rock. They serve some stupid rock from Sedona. <laughs> you hang a rock in your windshield and you're protected. No, better to trust in the rock Christ Jesus when you drive. Okay, so you just get that foolishness out of your head. Okay, they just took the word and try to make it natural. I, I understand where they came from. So Rish, that is this ability to grasp and understanding. Actually, the best uh, way I saw it written was a higher consciousness. An ability to think a little bit above the level of the world. Hello? It's a, it's, it's a favor of God. It's something good that he's given to us when we get born again. Where It's instilled in us. 
Amen. By hearing and hearing the Word of God. I've gotten so much revelation through the years of studying the Word of God to be able to apply it to my everyday life. And that's what I'm supposed to do is bring that to you. Now I know that you're going to love the third letter for it because it is Yod or it is Father God or it is the tree of life or it is the Christ that was to pay the price to birth the church, to birth salvation, to birth the Abrahamic covenant was the Christ. The blood and the cross paid for it. Although cross is not mentioned under Yod, only the tree of life is mentioned under, under, Yod, under Yod. The tenth or the tithe, everything as you've all heard me many times talk about, the tithe works. The word works through your giving. The word of God will always work through our giving. It will never work through our taking. It will only work through our giving. When we give love, it's at work. Hello? Now if we hold love, then nothing's working. If we hold our money, then our money's not working. But when we give money, whether it's our tithe to the house and we invest in something, this is how God multiplies and brings money to us. You've heard me teach on all of that before. And then... The last letter, which is Tav, this is the one that is all about self. It's interesting. This is written 3,500 years before Solomon, as far back as I've been able to study. And it, Tav is the 22nd letter of the ancient Hebrew. And it, it is the finish. It is the part of the finish. It is the prices paid. It is uh, the excellence of the prices paid. It is the, I talked about it last week, it is the cycle. Christ in heaven, sent to earth, returned. So it, it is, everything is in this pattern. It's not reincarnation, don't get stupid, but it is everything that God put in motion. So they're talking about, we're going to pollute the world. Well, you, how do you pollute the world with what's in the world? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, anyway, uh, that's okay. Oh, I don't need one. So, but it is redemption. It is salvation. This is what it means. It is the finished product. It is uh, the entrance into the church for the preparation of the bride, but it is the finished product. When Jesus said, it is finished, he's really talking about Tav. It is done. Now the, the, the finished product of salvation is deliverance. It's uh, redemption. It's uh, the cross paid the price. It is... Uh, the blood that flowed, it is the completion, all of it connected in the last letter. And that contains healing. It contains everything that we need on this earth to live successfully and then to live eternal with Father God through salvation. Y'all okay? I mean, this is just when I study this stuff and I find out something like this, do you see how expansive just the words Abrahamic covenant? Because we have a Reader's Digest Bible. This is just Reader's Digest of instruction from God. But if we study ourselves approved, we find out the depth of the Word of God. And it takes you down to the level of the truth of the Word of God. And you see, people that only read it on the surface end up on the wrong side. Because they don't understand the power. And a little bit that they do understand about the power is they want to get rid of the power so it doesn't come against them. So you've got to take down the crosses. We can't talk about the blood. We can't have the Bible in our schools. Do you know that you don't have to swear on your Bible anymore in a court? We're not binding people to the truth. We're binding people to the lie. That's a sad state of affairs. 
So I'm, I, I know that I, and I know that we need to be conscious this year of America. And we need to become conscious of the word Tav, the last letter of the Abrahamic Covenant, means to return everything to its original intent. Now I meditate on that for a while. From the garden to return everything to God's original intent. The last letter of the ancient Hebrew. To return. Oh, I feel the anointing on that. To return everything back to its original intent. And America better get a hold of this truth. That our Constitution was written by godly men based on the Word of God. And we need to get back to the intent of the Constitution and no longer interpretation because interpretation is leading billions of people to hell today because of their lack of interpretation of the Word of God and finding out what God's intent was. So you better vote right. You better vote according to the Bible. You better vote according to truth. You better vote, and you, better than that, you better vote. If we're going to save this country. And that's all I got to say about that. God's returning. Come on, think. God's trying to say to us, we've got to return to his original intent. If you're a boy, stay a boy. Original intent. Father God, we just pray in the name of Jesus, let truth be settled and those things that are not true be washed away in the precious blood of Jesus. Help me, Lord, as I teach truth. I believe that it is your will right now for even this country and for the word of God that we return to the original intent of our Father God at every level of our life. And we'll give you praise and glory for it. If somebody out there has never received Jesus as Lord and Savior, if I haven't run you off yet, it's your time to get saved. This is your moment. This is your time. Something's happened in your heart and you know you need Jesus. This is your opportunity. Not to become religious. No, it's, you need to escape the religion of this world. You need to come into the truth of Christ Jesus. Just pray, pray this prayer with me right now. And mean it in your heart. Your whole life can change. Just repeat after me. Dear Father God, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. And I ask you, dear Jesus, come into my life. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen. We introduce to you Living Word Virtual Church Community. Each week, we come together during the live stream, chatting with each other through live comment sections. Then, during the week, our virtual church community reconnects in online share groups to discuss the weekend service and study the Word. To sign up, visit the Living Word Virtual Church Community page on our website. We'll see you there.